All right. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Hopefully everybody um, has on the screen a, uh, a screenshot of fly fishing Crane Prairie Reservoir. Rini, if you could just kind of shake your head and acknowledge, I'll be able to. Perfect. And uh, as we go, um, and I've got a couple more, Chuck and Jack Glode. I'm going to admit them and hopefully that's okay. Um, so in any event, uh, Crane Prairie's really become um, one of my favorite places to fly fish. I, uh, when I first moved up here, uh, Crane was an enigma to me. I fished it um, a fair amount. Uh, my success rate was mediocre at best. And so over the past, um, I think I started fishing it in 1998. And uh, over the past, I would say five years or so, my learning curve has shot up dramatically. And, and what I'll try and share tonight is a little bit of what I've learned and uh, what I found out about Crane Prairie Reservoir. When I first started fishing, I, I jumped into the channels and fished with coronamids. And that's what I did for a long, long time. And some days I did great. And other days it, it was uh, mediocre. Um, and so let me, uh, let me kind of share some of what I've learned along the way. Uh, today I'm going to cover a number of things. I'm going to um, lead you through the seasons of crane um, from early spring right after opening day to the early uh, to late spring or early summer, midsummer, early fall, and finally uh, where we are right now is in late fall. And I think we're about 10 days away from Crane Prairie closing, 10 or 11 days away. Um, I've got a, a tour of Crane Prairie I'll take you on in. And I think it's important to understand the seasons of Crane and then take a tour of Crane and learn a lot about where to be when. I'm also going to introduce you to Navionics mapping software. It's the software I use on my uh, fish finder slash GPS unit on my boat. And I think you'll see why I like it. It's the best $200 investment I've ever made um, at Crane Prairie. Uh, by far and away, I, I have learned more about this lake having uh, some things um, unfold to uh, be able to get out and learn a lot about where to be when. Uh, I'm gonna touch on the fly gear and particularly the fly gear I use. Um, we're going to uh, talk through some of the bugs at Crane Prairie. Um, I used to think uh, it was a coronamid and coronamid only lake. And, and I've been, uh, I've learned very differently. There's a lot of different stuff that goes on at Crane throughout the year. And we'll translate that into fly patterns. And we'll, uh, we'll close out with a little fish handling and safety. And uh, lastly, we'll, um, finish up with a couple pretty shots of crane. I think this uh, scene you see in front of you is right there at the resort um, at the uh, boat launch. And this is uh, probably an early June launch. You can see still lots of snow up on the mountains. Just a beautiful place to be on an early, early morning. And if for no other reason, just to just to be there and just to see the um, the grandeur of the area in which we live is great. Uh, this picture, as you can see, is probably a little later in the summer. And this was taken a number of years ago. This is out near the Quinn Channel. And um, you can see all the standing trees that were left when they flooded the reservoir. As you go through a number of the slides today, you'll see a lot of these trees have fallen over. 
Um, the stumps in large part are still there. They're easy to hit with your prop, but um, a lot of the trees have fallen over and some of the channel areas are less clear to find than they were 20 years ago when I first started fishing crane. Uh, it's a little bit more uh, challenging to uh, to find the channels nowadays, and particularly as you're out in the lake of ways. So yeah, just a pretty, pretty area. Um, boy, when I'm, when I'm in the middle of winter, um, tying flies for crane, I keep thinking about this shot. Uh, back in 2015, during the drought, um, you can see this is in January and there's no snow in this picture. Um, we had a drought year and uh, um, I was able to hike into the Osprey uh, lookout out there at Crane and the lake was frozen over and just a beautiful view of the sisters from the Osprey Point area. And always the eagles, always the eagles. I get a big kick out of seeing these every time. And, and you know what? Every time one of these birds fly by, and I say that with a little disgust, it is guaranteed my indicator is going to go down. I don't know what it is about crane and eagles, but if you look at an eagle flying by, your indicator is going to go down. It just, it, it just happens. So um, more on that later. And always the eagles. I, I know in the springtime in, in June, it's typical to see a dozen or 15 eagles and or golden eagles, bald eagles and golden eagles out there or immature balds, uh, depending, but always lots, lots of life to see out there. So a little bit of uh, background on crane as we begin, just to give you some a little bit of history and a little bit of uh, just grounding on the reservoir itself. It was named for the sandhill cranes that nest here. And I think sandhill cranes used to nest in the meadows surrounding the Deschutes River and the upper Deschutes River that flows into what's now flooded by the reservoir. Um, but they still do nest in the meadows alongside the lake in various areas so that the, the name Crane Prairie is very aptly named. Um, it is 3,420 acres, surface acres at Bull Pool. Um, that's a lot of water. That's a lot of surface area. Um, and as a result, uh, it can be a real challenge to solve crane consistently. Uh, there's a lot of places to look for fish. Um, going into uh, the uh, back eddies and into the trees and along the channels. There's just lots of places for fish to hide. And fortunately, it's a very, very fertile lake because there's lots of fish in there. Um, the average depth is... Um, Uh, the average depth is about 15 feet, and that's fairly deceiving. Uh, the average depth is out in the main part of the lake, but a lot of the areas we fish and focus on are in the, uh, in the shallower water. I focus on anywhere from 2 to 12 feet as a rule, occasionally 14. Our max depth is about 20 feet. Um, it was interesting, the dam was actually constructed way back in 1922. It was rebuilt in 1940 to become what it is today. Our major inflows at Crane are the Upper Deschutes River, the Cultus River, and a variety of springs throughout the lake. Uh, as you know, our area has got a lot of holes in it and water flows through those holes and it comes up in springs throughout the uh, area um, made up below the, the Sisters and Broken Top and Bachelor. Um, I'm always stunned when I think about Mount Bachelor does not have a stream that flows off a mountain that gets 460 inches of snow a year. 
on average. And yet that's what happens. All that water flows into the ground and it bubbles up in springs throughout our area. And, and some of those flow directly into Crane Prairie. Um, but uh, the, the largest two inflows are the Upper Deschutes and the Cultus River. Um, and I'll cover those in a, in a bit more detail as we take a tour of the lake. And the reservoir supports a myriad of wildlife. I love going out here for the ducks and geese and eagles and uh, pelicans and all sorts of stuff that frequents the lake itself. And along the edge of the lake, there's lots of elk and deer and um, other, other things in the areas. It's a real, real fertile area. I mushroom hunt around Crane Prairie and get morels and chanterelles uh, during the right seasons each year. So it's, it's really a neat place to be. But one of the main reasons we go there is for these guys. Uh, Crane Prairie is an extremely fertile lake. Um, it's, it's one of the high desert um, lakes in the Great Basin. And as a result, it's somewhat alkali, which makes it incredibly rich. Uh, bugs thrive in Crane. Um, there's just an awful lot of, um, awful lot of bug life in this, in this reservoir and bugs translate into fish food. And so the fish grow very, very fast. They're typically planted in the lake at a uh, smaller size and they'll grow up to 20 inches in a matter of uh, two or three years. Whoops, going the wrong way here. So speaking of the fish, um, we really target three major species in the lake. There are lots of other stuff thanks to some of our uh, bucket biologists but um, crane bows, as they're nicknamed, the, the rainbows that are native to Crane Prairie, um, grow to prodigious size. Uh, reports of 10 pound plus fish every year happen. Um, back in the day, maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago, 10 pound fish were a lot more common than they are today. And I think that's because they're putting more fish in the lake. Um, and the uh, catch rates are up tremendously from 15 years ago. Um, it's common to catch, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 fish in a day if you hit a good day. Whereas back in the day with a bit larger fish, it was, uh, it was really one or two or maybe a, a few. Um, but nonetheless, we also have a lot of brook trout in this lake and the brook trout uh, spawn in the upper deschutes. Um, they also spawn probably in the Cultus River as well. And lastly, the upper fish is a kokanee salmon in full spawning colors. And this picture was taken probably about uh, four or five weeks ago um, in the Cultus Channel on Crane as the fish were staging for their annual spawning run up the Cultus River. But some of the kokanee salmon, particularly early season, can be nice size. And boy, do they eat good. I'll take one uh, way more quickly than any of the other species of trout that uh, we pursue. Oop, I missed, a, uh, missed moving a slide a minute ago. Hang tight on this one, I'm getting to it, but uh, I'm gonna start with uh, Seasons of Crane. Um, first, I wanna talk about the rules and I'm reminded of uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Rules in a knife fight? Well, there are rules for fishing crane and I've, I've introduced five of them here. Um, the first I've, I've talked about a moment ago, don't watch the eagles. I finally had to make this a rule on my boat um, because every time an eagle flew by and someone looked at it, the indicator went down. And how they know, I don't know, but 98.3% uh, of the time uh, you watch an eagle go by, your strike indicator is going to go down. It's just, it's just something that, that happens in Crane. I, I can't explain it, but how do they know? Um, some of the others are 
more useful. Um, one of the cardinal rules I follow at Crane, if it ain't happening, move. Do something different. Crane is a 30, um, what did I say, 3,400 acres. The fish can often be anywhere, and they may or may not be where you are at the present time. Or it could be that there isn't hatch activity going on somewhere where you are. So I make it a rule that if it ain't happening, move. And I'll usually give it anywhere from 15 minutes to 30 minutes. And every so often I get a pull down about the 30, about 29 minute mark. And it tempts me to stay a lot longer. And that's usually an error. Um, if it ain't happening, move. Find someplace different, try something different. And uh, if others around me are catching fish and, and perhaps I'm not, change flies, do something different. Um, you can always move closer. Uh, you, you can park right in the, the person's tip pocket. Uh, you know, as long as you give them 10 feet in between boats, I think you're, you're safe, maybe 12, but uh, you kind of get the gist. If you're, uh, if others are catching fish, something's not working that you're doing. Either you're not directly over fish, or you're not on the right uh, pattern at a given point in time. So do something different. Um, one of the other things I've learned about Crane Prairie is fish like structure, and damn, they know how to use it to their advantage. Um, I tell a funny story from this spring. I was out on a flat on Crane and there was a big root ball stump sticking up above the water in about maybe three feet of water. And I saw a fish rise just beyond that root ball as I'm in mid cast and I, I redirected. And I, as I was releasing my, my fly line, I, I said out loud, I said, this is suicide, but it has to be done. So I landed a little carry special, gave it a couple strips and doggone if that big old trout didn't come and whack it. And he went straight for that root ball and wrapped me up one side and down the other. And we uh, moved the boat over to try and uh, unhook him. And he was patient with us for a bit, but we couldn't get a net under the root ball to try and net this 21 or 22 inch fish and ultimately said, I've had enough, broke me off and, and went on. Made for a good story though, but do fish around the structure and don't be afraid of it. Um, you are gonna lose some flies and that's just part of fishing Crane Prairie. And then lastly, I'll leave you with, and this is more and much more important for summertime when fishing channels focus on the outside of the bends. During summer, the water is deeper and thereby colder on the outside of, of the river channel bends. And I'll show you what that means as we take our tour of Crane and you get a chance to see some of those things. So let me uh, talk you through Crane by the season. I'm going to I'm going to cover spring when the fish are scattered. Um, some of the keys here are to find food, to find fish. In the early summer, we have hatches begin to really progress and things get really good. Um, in the midsummer, our hatches begin to wane and the water warms. And one of the keys to this time period is finding cold water to find fish. And I'll share some of the areas I look to in Crane to, to make that happen. In the early fall, our hatches return. And some of the ways you find fish are going out early in the morning and uh, look for rising fish. And when you find a, a concentration, focus on that particular area. And late fall, the water cools and the fish scatter. And it becomes much more challenging uh, in the late fall and your expectations have to obviously match it. And so um, I'll cover these in a bit more detail uh, over the next several slides. Before we do, I thought I'd throw in a, 
uh, a little teaser pick. This was uh, taken on an iPhone in burst mode as we released a, a real nice rainbow off my boat and uh, just kind of a cool shot. The, the four pictures we got um, on the iPhone in burst mode during this release, you can play around and get some really nice photography with your, with your phone. Um, although as the fellow I was fishing with said, use a, uh, a wrist strap because uh, you'll drop your phone at some point in time and then it's worthless. So anyway, spring. Let's start in the spring. And I usually begin fishing cranes shortly after opening day um, in that first week of the season. And what I found in that early, early season is the fish are very scattered. You need, need to find food to find fish. Um, weed beds really have not begin, begun to establish yet. We're coming off winter. Um, and winter means that those fish have had to be down below the ice for a long time. And, uh, and so we need to find food to find fish. And this is the time of year that structure becomes really, really important. Also the time of year to um, look at the flats, uh, motor the flats until you find fish. In that early season time period, I'm focusing on flats in maybe eight to 10 feet of water depth. Um, very clearly at this time of year, the fish are not channel oriented, um, but right at opening day, they will be in places where we had open water earliest, which is at the mouth of the Cultus River and the mouth of the uh, Upper Deschutes. Those um, generally never freeze, or, or if they do, it's only for short periods. And so they've had open water and midge hatches and other things going on. And so in the very, very early spring, You've got to move around and move around a, a lot to find fish because they can literally be anywhere. They're not driven to uh, water temperatures near like they will be midsummer. So the early summer is a great time to be on crane and this is probably prime time. Early summer, I would uh, really uh, start as early to mid June. Um, right about that time, we start having very, very aggressive hatches start. Um, we start with caramids and calabatas and damsels. There's also lots of leeches in the lake. Um, and when we have hatches going on, the, the anchor rope can really provide a clue. Uh, anybody care to guess what you see on the anchor rope there on my boat? Um, damsels. This was probably about the second week of June this year in that early, early part of summer. Um, and this particular day, I had tons of damselflies crawling up my anchor rope. And uh, boy, I tell you, we had a pretty good day on uh, stripping damsels uh, in and around structure. I was in some fairly timbered water uh, most of the timber was lying flat on the bottom of the lake in about four to six feet of water, generally a lot more shallow than most people fish crane. Um, but I've gone in two to six feet of water. Those fish will be in shallow looking for food. Um, and that's when the lake really lights up. And that's when things really, really get good is in that early um, early summer, late spring time frame. Again, they're not channel oriented. So you want to really focus on flats and structure and be in a lot shallower rather than a lot deeper. So let's move into mid summer and depending on um, your uh, weather patterns in any given year, this happens Typically around early July, it sometimes can happen later than that. If you recall this year, we had that blistering heat wave and we went from that early, uh, early summer 
great patches and overnight we were in midsummer temperatures and the water temps on crane ramped up extremely quickly uh extremely quickly and really shut a lot of the hatches down and so you had to change tactics dramatically uh during that two week period or week and a half period i didn't even fish crane it was just too darn hot uh to be out there both for me and for the fish but uh in the midsummer, as the water warms you have to think cold water to find fish find cold water that's where the fish want to be and so the channels become really, really important in the mid summer. And also the river inlets become important. Um, the channels in deeper water, 12 to 14 feet, if you can find it. Um, but also the fish are moving into the mouths of the Deschutes River and the Cultus River and also the Quinn and Rock Creek, and I'll show you these areas as we do our tour in a few minutes. Um, depth and GPS are indispensable for uh, this time of year, and I'll share with you how I find my depth and my structure using uh, my, my GPS fish finder unit with Navionics software. Um, this time of year, I'm often fishing 10 to 14 feet, more often than not, I'm bobbicating. I'm using a, uh, and, and, and forgive me for using this highly offensive term to us, um, really good fly fishermen, but I, I, I use a bobber. Um, some people call it a strike indicator, but other people call it a bobber, and we'll call it what it really is. It's a bobber. Um, but uh, bobbicating is really the norm, and some of the keys that I have are to, Keep it moving. Um, go ahead and uh, when you cast out, let your flies settle down, but don't just leave it and stare at it for hours on end until that eagle flies by and you look at him and your bobber goes down. So keep your uh, strike indicator moving. Fish will often take as soon as you move the flies. It'll lift gently and then it'll drop gently. Uh, balanced leeches, caddis pupa, coronamids, damsels become real important. The damsel hatch tends to progress starting in very, very shallow water, but it'll run all through the month of July. You just have to look for it in different places. It starts in two to four feet of water. And then over time, as the lake heats up, the deeper water has damsel hatches going on. And so using damsel nymphs under an indicator can be important in the mid summer. Fish handling becomes critical and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that. Um, crane prairie surface temps get excessive during summer, uh, lethal to fish. Uh, and so I have followed a few rules um, when I'm fishing warm water in the middle of summer. And what I mean by warm water, um, my uh, temperature gauge on my boat, which is probably in the top six inches of water, uh, I ran a couple places where I saw surface temps at 78 degrees this summer. And that's lethal to trout. And so you need to be fishing in areas where it's not lethal. And um, you need to practice good fish handling etiquette as well. Uh, I almost always use three X at this time of year. I don't wanna burn a fish out. I'm gonna horse him in like a black bass. I'm gonna bring him in quick, get him in the net, uh, release him, never touch the fish if I can help it and uh, get him back deep to um, get back into the deeper, colder water. So fish, uh, handling in fish quick is important. I don't take fish out of the water at all during this time period. Um, I, just, I just practice a rule to keep them wet, keep them in the net, in the water, and release them as quickly as you can to get them back down deep. I fish barbless so that I can release them quickly. Uh, and I find that a real benefit to uh, uh, release fish uh, during this time of year. And so, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's important. 
And lastly, fish early and quit early. Uh, fishing early, I was getting out at 6.30, maybe 7, and I was quitting by noon or 12.30 during the day. Um, I was also tending to target areas in close to the Cultus River or the Upper Deschutes River where the water flowing in was much colder than that 78 degrees I was getting out in the middle of the lake. And so just some safety tips for the trout. Um, this is a chart that uh, Gabe Parr with the trout bus published some years ago, and he gave, gave us the okay to use it. Um, he posted a number of these in a variety of areas. Uh, and I've kept it and I, I publish it usually on the Sun, Sun River Anglers Facebook page. But you can see when we're in that 38 to 45, it's pretty cold. Um, trout are uh, moving slow and feeding slow. Uh, kind of between 45 and 60 is really optimal. And as we start getting above 60 to 65, it's starting to get a bit warm. And I start thinking about uh, trying to get uh, fish in a little quicker. I don't want to play them out and really tire them out because they take a long time to recover. And certainly once we get above 65, um, we start reaching the danger zone. No, I will fish in 72 degrees of water, but I'm fishing in deeper, deeper water. I'm probably in a channel at that time of year. And uh, when I get down a foot, a couple of feet, three feet, the water is significantly colder than it is right on the surface. And that's why it's really important to play out fish quickly and release them quickly to get back into that colder water. Also using a temperature gauge so you can see where the thermocline is set up or what the temperatures are at a deeper level where you're fishing and that'll help you understand kind of what you're, uh, what you're playing with. So it's a good, good guide um, to uh, follow. Moving on to the early fall, uh, we kind of flip back into that um, early summer time period. Our hatches return. We start looking for rising fish. Water levels are at their lowest for the season. Uh, Crane Prairie got to down to about 33,200 acre feet. Um, at the beginning of the season, it was 46, 47,000. Uh, acre feet. So it dropped by about 25%, maybe 30% over the course of the season, starting in July, uh, when the irrigators started pulling water uh, off of Crane and down into the river. Um, but at this time of year, the water's starting to cool off nicely. And the structure and stumps are even more apparent because all those stumps rise above the water. So you got a lot more stuff to hit. Uh, with your boat when you're navigating in crane at this time of year. Um, the fish tend to move out of the river channels at this time of year, and they move back to the flats. They move back to those weed beds, and, and we start looking for calabatus again. Uh, we had calabatus in June and early July. We have dribs and drabs through the summer, but they return in earnest in uh, early to mid-September. Also important at this time of year is terrestrials, beetles, ants, hoppers. If you read my flight time column at all, you saw that I had a chubby Chernobyl on there uh, this last month. Well, a chubby is a great um, strike indicator fly and putting a dropper off it. But um, the chubby is imitating a beetle or a very large ant. And I can't tell you the number of times out at Crane, I had fish come up and eat the chubby in September and uh, hook up. Also caddis return. Leeches are ever present throughout the season and that's always a go-to, but dragonfly nymphs become a little more important at this time of year as well as those fish start navigating the flats. So early fall is a, 
a great time of year to be on crane and they had some good days. The fish have been fished over a lot. And sometimes you got a leader down a little bit. Uh, at one point in time, we were using 6X and I'll talk about that on the gear in a minute, but um, it's, a, it's a great time of year. And then later fall, the water cools and the fish scatter. This picture was taken, uh, I think it was the opening day of duck season this year. And uh, you can see the frost on the ground in this picture. It was chilly. I think it was 21 or 23 degrees out. And the hatches are starting to really wane and our weed beds are decreasing. And coronamids again become kind of the most important bug going on. And again, like early spring, you've got to move often to find fish. They really scatter uh, because there's nothing that really needs to keep them centrally located like happens in the uh, early summer, summer and early fall. So now let's begin a tour of Crane and let's learn a little bit about the reservoir and some places to be uh, when. Um, I'll use my, um, my maps here. Uh, I've got a little laser pointer. I think most of you know where Crane is, hopefully. Um, but you can get to Crane on the 40 road out here um, or on the 42 road from Sun River. Uh, this is the Cascade Lakes Highway, uh, Forest Road 46, along the west side of the lake. Um, it's pretty quick and easy. It's about 35 minutes from my house to the uh, boat launch by the resort. So this is uh, a Google Earth image of Crane Prairie, and this will give you a better picture of the lake itself. Um, and I wanna use this just to ground you on some locales in the lake itself. Uh, some things I want you to notice here. You can see big flat, uh, big meadow sections all along here, uh, river inlet, river inlet, uh, big trees all along here, river inlet, uh, kind of rocky shore, um, steeper rocky shore, and then a real rocky shore all the way along the south side of the lake. All those things are important um, to understand. So as I'm grounding you on Crane, let me just introduce where things are uh, at, a, at a real high level. We've got three major launches on Crane to uh, launch from the, res the uh, public launch by the resort. Uh, is the nearest one to Sun River. It's the, probably the one I launch at most often, although I'm looking at wind and weather when I make that decision. If I've got a, a real strong uh, northerly or, or westerly wind, I may opt to launch on the west side to get out of the wind. But uh, very often I launch at the resort and that gives me good access to the chutes and cultus channels. We also have a launch at Quinn River. It does not have docks on it, so I rarely launch my bigger boat there, but it's a great place to launch a float tube or a pontoon boat and be out in um, really productive water really quickly. And at Rock Creek, um, there's a good launch here. Parking is a bit at a premium, because there are not that many places to park. So beware on a weekend that uh, you could get, uh, have challenges parking over there, but it's a, also a very, very good launch. And I launch there uh, when I'm on the west side of the lake. And lastly, an unimproved launch on the, uh, up near the dam, this is a dirt launch. Um, I've never launched there, but I, I see guys launching uh, aluminum boats and other things uh, there quite regularly. So just to be aware that that's there. Also all along the south part of the lake, um, there are a number of little roads that go into these areas all along here and you can launch a float tube 
um, where you can get close to the lake. There, there's lots of unimproved camping um, in areas of uh, Crane. And so those are good places just to launch a float tube or a uh, pontoon boat. So let me orient you to some of the key structure in Crane. Um, the upper dish chutes, inlet and flat, really come in just down from the resort launch, maybe about a mile. Um, and uh, we'll talk about that in greater detail. The Deschutes channel runs all along the south bank until it exits out to the dam. Um, and we'll see a bit more of that structure in some upcoming slides. We've also got the Cultus Channel that's about a mile over from the Deschutes Channel. Although it's a long ride around, uh, on a boat you might launch here, you'll run and follow the Deschutes Channel all the way up to about here, and then you run straight across and then down into the Cultus Channel. Although you could run across through here. This is very treed and uh, uh, it, it's got lots of stuff to run into. And so I don't tend to go that way very, very often. The Quinn Channel is right by the Quinn Launch, uh, really easily accessible to uh, especially smaller boats and um, pontoon boats. You can row out to real productive water really quickly. And lastly, Rock Creek, and I'll, I'll share a bit more about Rock Creek, and that's just over from the Rock Creek boat launch. A couple other areas to be aware of, the dam arm. Um, there are some good areas to focus on in that area, and the Browns Mountain Bank as well. So let me jump. Um, away from Google Earth, and let me jump into Navionics mapping software. This is the view I get of Crane Prairie Reservoir on my uh, GPS fish finder. Um, and what's the first thing you see there? Uh, a couple big things jump out at you. One are the water depths, or at least the relative water depths, showing you where that 15 foot mark is roughly all the way around the lake. But more importantly, look at the, the river channels. Um, the river channels are flowing uh, all through the lake. We've got the Deschutes Channel. We've got the Cultus Channel. We've got the Quinn Channel. And we've got Rock Creek. And so those are important things to be aware of. Um, those are real, real important at certain times of year and less important at other times of year. Uh, and I'm going to auger in and focus down on each respective area in a little more depth. So, and the dam arm as well. So let's jump into the Deschutes arm channel and flats. I spend a fair amount of time time within the confines of this slide um, in the early spring, uh, a bit less so in the mid spring, early summer, because I'm elsewhere in the lake. And then I return to this uh, extensively in the early fall um, in that September time frame. I'm also going to fish targeted spots in here midsummer like right up close to the uh, river mouth. So let's digest the Deschutes uh, arm a bit and understand what's there. Well, the, the river comes in right at the upper center of the slide. And there is a a river channel to follow there. This map does not show, but the river channel actually splits. And there's a second piece of it that comes on and it flows down uh, until it, it combines back into the main river channel, but it kind of splits in through here and it rejoins in here. So there are actually two little river channels. 
this whole area is pretty shallow. Uh, early season, it'll run uh, four to six feet deep. Um, late season, uh, I'm often up in two feet, three feet, four feet of water um, as, as uh, time goes by over the course of this season. So some key things to look at in this picture. I mentioned earlier one of the rules at Crane, fishing the outside of channel bends. And that's important to understand. With a depth finder on your boat, it's pretty easy to find the channel. If you know basic navigation in and around Crane, it is quite difficult to know very specific spots on the channel that might be important, like these channel bends you see. And why is that? Especially midsummer, um, our, our deepest water is our coldest water in the channels. And the deepest water always occurs on the outside of the bends of the river channel. The inside of the bends is a nice sandy beach, but the outside is the place where the river has coursed and deepened up. And so focusing on those channel bends is important. And each and every one of these on this map that you see, including the ones I haven't highlighted, um, are good places to target in that early summer, midsummer time frame, and also into the early fall as those fish are migrating from channel orientation back to the flats. There's also some major flats to be aware of. Um, on the east side of the Deschutes Channel and on the west side of the Deschutes Channel and just off the uh, river inlet, um, I often see a whole bunch of little prams anchored up right along this flat right, right in here. And that's because there's a bunch of really good weed beds in the summer. I also see a bunch of prams anchored up along in here. And those guys know this lake uh, back and forth. There are a bunch of good flats right in here. Those fish are near cold water coming out of the upper chutes, and they're near food in the flats. And so these are areas in the early season to target, in the um, early summer to target, and less important, as we get into midsummer. Um, but again, getting back in here in the uh, early fall is a good time to start targeting back into uh, those flat areas. I also mentioned timber structure, and by no means did I circle all of it, because there is timber everywhere in this lake, really all along this channel there is timber here and there, really starting about here and going all the way out until it runs into the open lake quite a ways out. Um, and focusing on that timber structure early season and uh, early summer uh, is really a, a good, good time to be in those spots um, and, and really beginning to understand the seasons of crane. Let me shift out of the uh, Deschutes channel and let me jump over to the Cultus channel. We saw where that was. It's about a mile to the west of the Deschutes channel. Um, number of things here. This is probably an area I spend an awful lot of my time over the course of the season. Um, there are a lot of fish in the Cultus channel and uh, you can see the inlet comes in uh, right on the north side of the lake. Uh, the Cultus River is a very, very cold river. I hiked in to the headwaters to the Cultus River last year, uh, last fall, and it's a really cool spot. It's a pain in the neck to get there because there's all kinds of deadfall, but there's a big rocky hill and the river just comes out of the ground right uh right at the bottom of the hill and becomes a river. And uh, it flows just a couple, three, probably three miles down into Crane Prairie. So that water is very, very 
cold. It's down in the 40 degree range or maybe a little bit more uh, depending on the time of year. And so it always has cold water around it. We also have the Little Cultus River, less important area, but occasionally there are fish that hold off the Little Cultus River. A lot of timber to get from the Cultus River Inlet over to the Little Cultus River Inlet. And so uh, lots, of, lots of deadfall to, to run through. You'll see the Cultus River is a little straighter than the Deschutes was, but there definitely are some, some bends in the channel that can be important um, as we go in the midsummer. Uh, the the uh, Cultus River is a deeper river channel. It'll run 15 feet deep in places early season. And so it's an important place to be. Um, but in that early season to uh, early summer, there are also big flat areas to, just to the east of the Cultus River channel. And there's also substantial timber structure really on both sides of the Cultus River channel. So I spend an awful lot of my time either in the flats or in that timber structure right along the Cultus uh, up until summer, um, up until summer. Uh, and during summer, we've got uh, uh, some other stuff going on. You've got to focus more on the channel itself. But in the early and late time periods, those flats and that timber carry an awful lot of fish. So I'm out of the channel and fishing in that structure or out on those flats quite frequently. Let me jump over to the Quinn River and introduce you to some of uh, the structure in this area. Before I do, I'll mention the outer cultus. Um, cultus River flows from where we saw it on the map a moment ago, all the way over toward Quinn, and then it turns south and it rolls out on, on out to the center of the lake. And there are a number of big, big bends in the outer cultus. Being able to pinpoint those is uh, pretty invaluable. Um, you can run your boat right up to the uh, corner of this particular bend and fish the outside of it or anchor up on the inside and cast to the outside. Um, and so knowing where those are is uh, a real important portion of using this Vionic software. But the Quinn River comes out of the Quinn River Inlet. There's really not a river coming into the lake, it springs that bubble up out of the ground right at the lake's edge. And there's multiple springs all along the Quinn River uh, Inlet, uh, right next to the Quinn River uh, campground and boat launch. And so um, again, lots of cold water coming in right at Quinn River. We've got the channel bends to be aware of. We've got big, big flats. Once we're outside the trees on the Quinn River Channel, it's a huge flat area, and uh, the fish can be kind of anywhere, but choosing some areas in and around and close to the cold water of the channels is usually real, real important. Uh, so exploring those areas. And then right on the inner Quinn, there's a ton of timber structure uh, right along the river channel, and being off in that timber um, maybe trying to find some poles or some breaks in the structure is where you want to anchor up and fish quite frequently. And so that's important to understand about Quinn. And again, same rules. Midsummer, we want to be in that channel. But the rest of the time, for the most part, we want to be in the timber or on the flats. And just a um, there's a Quinn Cultus confluence, and it's one of the deeper areas of Crane Prairie. And that area between the two can be a really productive uh, spot to target. Uh, that little kind of Y that you see um, up in uh, up in this area here, uh, that can be really good as we've got cold water here. We've got cold water here and we've got food in the flat in the middle. And so 
um, that Quinn cultus confluence can be good at the right time of year, usually latter summer. Let me jump over to Rock Creek Channel and Flats and, and share what that looks like. The Rock Creek Inlet is a misnomer. Um, there is no inlet anymore. It is a spring that bubbles up at the bottom of the lake or at the bottom of the reservoir. The, the creek channel doesn't extend into the side of the lake. And so um, if you don't know it's there, you don't know it's there. And so this is a little more difficult to find, but you can be uh, 50 yards offshore in a real shallow bay and yet be in 12 feet of water. Now I fished uh, Rock Creek a few times this year. It was not that good. And I speculate the springs were down because of our low water situation and the trout didn't use it that much because there wasn't that much cold water in here. The year prior, we had some great days in the Rock Creek Channel and flats. And so, um, it's a good place to learn and a good place to be aware of, especially when we've got a really strong westerly wind. It's a lot more sheltered over in that uh, side. And again, we have the channel bends, we have the big flats, and we have the Quinn River, uh, Quinn Rock Creek confluence to uh, look for and target. And again, if you if you don't have a good GPS, you can't find that. So this Navionic software really uh, pays dividends to have on your fish finder. The dam area is, is kind of the last area of this uh, tour. And uh, I'll mention the Big Browns Mountain Flat. I do spend time over here, usually when I'm not finding fish elsewhere in the spring, I'll give the Browns Mountain Flat a try out in 12 to 14 feet of water uh, off the bank. And uh, that seems to always hold fish. I've never had big numbers over here, but I've had some good days, um, you know, and some, some nice fish. We also have the dam arm flat, big, big, wide open flat area that can be productive, especially earlier season as those fish are kind of spread out. And then in toward the dam, but not quite, there's a bunch of timber right in this area of the dam. And that tends to hold fish, especially early season, early summer. Um, and so that's a good place to target, especially if you're not finding fish elsewhere. And then a pleasant surprise this year, I was out one day in the uh, kind of early spring and had a tough, tough day. We fish probably half a dozen different locales. And I think we boated one or two fish. And I moved into an area along this rocky shoreline and points. And uh, it was a real windy day coming out of the Northeast. And we got a, a little bit of um, protection in against this bank. And we pulled into a spot and anchored up and never moved for about three hours and had uh, indicators down nonstop. So that's a good area to explore early season. Um, there are some springs over in this area. I don't know exactly where they are, but those springs would hold fish throughout the winter. And uh, they would be there in the uh, early, early spring as we start the season. They would, they would start their season there. So that's our tour. Let me jump into some of the gear I use. Uh, I keep it relatively simple, but I do make sure I've got plenty. Um, I'm gonna start with rods. Uh, I, I use a five or a six weight rod. In the summer, uh, when we're in that real warm water, I like to go to a six weight, just because I can, I can horse the fish a little bit more aggressively on three X and get them in quickly. And so I'm going to, I'm going to probably err on the side of a, a six weight rod uh, at that time of year. Um, I do carry as a rule, uh, three to four rods with me in my boat. I've got two set up for a dry line. Uh, I've got one set up with a strike indicator and one set up for dry fly action. If 
you happen upon some. I also use extensively a hover line. And a hover line is a very, very slow sinking line uh, that I use for shallow water. I use it for damsels and leeches and caddis pupa. And uh, I, I'm fishing a hover line in probably two to six feet of water um, in the shallows and typically early and late. Uh, it can be a real important line. An intermediate sink, probably my least used line in my quiver. I usually carry one, I rarely use it. Uh, when I'm in deeper water, most of the time I've got on a strike indicator, um, but an intermediate sink can be useful stripping the leeches in deeper water. Um, it is much, much too fast a sink rate to fish correctly slowly enough in two to six feet of water. It'll go straight down to the bottom and hang up. And so that's where that hover line is really a, a much uh, more important line. For leaders, I usually buy just nine foot 3X or 4X mono. More often than not, I, I'm using 3X leaders. I almost always use fluorocarbon tippet. Um, and uh, 3X is kind of my all-purpose subsurface. Uh, if I start getting in real clear water areas and I feel I need the leader down, um, I will. If I'm dry fishing, I'll start with 4X. If I'm getting a lot of refusals, I might, uh, I might have to leader down to 5X or even 6X. Um, sometimes in the uh, later summer, fishing calabatus in the real shallow water uh, up the cultus channel, I'm probably running 15 to 18 feet of leader. Um, and I may leader down to 6x. We had a day out there this year, I was fishing 4x and I got refusal after refusal. So we went down to 6x and I started hooking fish right and left. I probably uh, hooked eight or 10 fish on dry flies in there. Uh, ask me how many I landed? One. Um, I broke almost everything else off. Uh, 6X is not good enough for crane as a rule, but it's fun. It's all good. So bugs, let me introduce you to the key bugs to be aware of in crane. And one of the things I've found from day to day to day to day, things change and they can change dramatically. Um, what worked yesterday may not work today. That's why I suggested if it's not working, either move or change flies. So in the early spring, we're going to focus on coronamids. Um, and the early summer is coronamids are important. But coronamids live in muddy areas, like in river channels uh, or former river channels. So they're less uh, common out on the big flat areas, they're much more important in the channels. And so um, coronamids can be real important at certain times. I used to always fish coronamids all the time in crane. I've been cured of that. Damsels, um, mid-June through July. Mid-June starting, we'll have damsel hatches in the shallower waters that will progress out to deeper waters through the end of July. Um, and so some of the outer cultus areas, we'll see damsel hatches going in late July in 12 to 15 feet of water. Calabatus. Um, crane in past years did not have much of a calabatus hatch, but it's really improved. Excuse me. I, I uh, jumped over leeches. Leeches are important all season. It is one of the core food sources in crane. Um, when I first start in the area, I'm often on a balanced leech um, and I'm using a, like a black and red balanced leech, uh, real, real important throughout the season. And one of my go-to uh, patterns really at any time on crane prairie. Calabatus, uh, June and early July, it didn't 
used to be a Calabatus lake, but the last several years, the Calabatus hatch has really come on strong. And I saw a couple of days out there, we had absolute blanket hatches of Calabatus on those cloudy uh, days. And so uh, real, real important. Um, you can see this is a picture of Jeff Weiland, and he is covered in Calabatus spinners on this given day out in the uh, cultus channel. Caddis. Um, up until a couple of years ago, I didn't realize how important caddis were in crane. And yet there's a little black caddis, there's a little tan caddis in the fall. Right now there are October caddis. Uh, so really June, July and September, October, outside the really peak periods of heat. Um, uh, caddis are quite important. Uh, dragonflies in the uh, summer and early fall. And lastly, in the late summer and into early fall till it gets cold, uh, terrestrials, beetles, ants, hoppers. Um, you saw that, uh, you may have seen in the last Angler's newsletter that Chubby Chernobyl uh, is a, a big beetle or a big ant imitation and I took a bunch of fish on that this fall. So let me jump into fly patterns. These are a few that I use. Picture upper right is my fly, coronamid fly box. Um, I tend to use anywhere from about size 12 on down to about size 16 or 18 occasionally. Um, in, uh, I don't usually get too complicated. I'm using a snow cone pattern more often than not. If I'm fishing coronamids, uh, we don't need to get too, too complex. I also tie um, the lower right is a little, uh, what I've nicknamed the food court midge. Uh, it's a little midge pattern that uh, is not a bad thing to have in your box for early season, uh, up near the mouth of the upper Deschutes, mouth of Cultus River. Uh, can be really important. Damsels, these are three of the damsel patterns I use. Uh, little um, uh, orange bead, orange glass bead, uh, olive uh, woolly bugger, basically. Uh, bottom left is just Denny Rickert Stillwater Nymph and a little lion's mane damsel. Um, I also use these in a kind of a a more a brown or a rust color as well uh, can be depending on the structure I'm in and around. Uh, leeches, uh, be it stripped or be it balanced. Um, I'm oftentimes stripping leeches in real shallow water or especially in the deeper water, I'm fishing balanced leeches under an indicator. The leech you see on the upper right there is uh, probably my number one producer at Crane Prairie. I catch more fish on this fly day in and day out than just about any other fly I fish. And so it's a black and red bruised uh, leech. And so good, good pattern. I, uh, I tend to go smaller with it. I, I fish these in a, oh, about a size 10, 12, 14 often. Um, and so I, I'm going real small. Uh, Calabatus, uh, when Calabatus happen, real important. Uh, starting upper left, I've got a Calabatus nymph parachute, a spinner pattern. Um, the middle uh, two left flies are a couple of different cripples. Uh, the right um, of that is a little wally wing. Uh, Calabatus bottom is an, another little parachute and a soft tackle. Um, all real good patterns for crane when the Calabatus hatch is going off. I'll fish these in size 14s in um, June, early July, I'll fish them in 16s, maybe even 18s in uh, the September Calabatus hatches. They get smaller. Caddis patterns. Uh, a couple of months ago, I tied the little black bead assassin pattern. Excellent pattern. I also tie this in a an olive and in a tan. Uh, both are great producers. Um, I'll fish this in tandem with that balanced leech 
frequently and, and the combo of those two almost always does well. Um, if I'm seeing caddis dry flies, this little black um, cripple caddis has been an excellent pattern for crane. A little uh, Henry's, uh, Henry's fork caddis can be good. Occasionally we'll get Goddard caddis, skating caddis, and this is especially uh, targeted in October when the October caddis are out. It's not a prolific hatch out there, but the fish know they're there in October. And so a couple of patterns that I use on crane for caddis. Uh, dragonflies, I keep it very simple. Uh, a carry special, or I might use a, um, a, a woolly bugger pattern to imitate a dragonfly nymph. And you can see the color and structure on the fly on the right. Uh, probably more often than not, I'm on a carry special, and that's a really good pattern. Uh, I rely on that kind of mid-August uh, through September up on the Deschutes flat and up toward the Deschutes channel in shallow. Terrestrials. Um, there's that chubby Chernobyl I had in my fly tying column last time. Um, I'll occasionally also fish hoppers. I will fish ants, uh, beetles, other things uh, can be real important. Uh, really from that August time frame on through September and into early October, uh, terrestrials can be real, real important. Uh, I picked up some nice fish on this chubby uh, probably about two and a half weeks ago, fishing real shallow water up in the upper cultus. And just some other useful ones. Um, a little AP black is very similar to the assassin pattern. Uh, we've got a little um, soft tackle pheasant tail, uh, a little Euro style pheasant tail, uh, another little soft tackle pheasant tail. Again, all of these can be uh, good patterns to try at various times. Got no magic formula on any given day. I'll go back to what I said earlier. If it ain't working, change, either move or change patterns. So um, these are the suite of patterns that I typically use on Crane Prairie. Um, I got a few others that I'll, I'll try on occasion, but these are all my more consistent producers. Um, boating safety on crane is I'm getting toward the end here. Uh, just wanted to emphasize there is a lot of structure to hit out there on Crane Prairie. Um, when they flooded the reservoir, they flooded all the trees. Um, over time, you are going to hit something. Uh, it's just, it's inevitable. Um, so the lake has a speed limit of 10 miles an hour. I, I fish out of a glass boat. I don't tend to run my boat any more than about six or seven miles an hour on crane at any point in time. So it's, it's more or less a fast troll. And I do always wear a life vest. Uh, thank goodness I've never had to use it, but I've got some of these auto inflate real lightweight ones that are easy to wear and easy to throw on. And uh, I don't even know they're there over the course of the day. One of these days I will trip and go over. I hope not, but uh um, hopefully this will give me some protection. You can see over my hat all of the structure uh, in the water to hit at Crane Prairie. And as we reach low water in the fall, uh, boy, that structure all, co all comes shallower and shallower. So let me just show you a couple of parting shots and some pretty scenery and a couple pretty fish. Uh, this was a fish I caught in very shallow water um a few weeks back probably back in september in the upper cultus uh channel uh probably fishing in two to three feet and fishing a little um tan uh bird's nest and stripped it right in front of this fish and sight cast to him and and watched him take and about a, a 19 maybe a 20 inch fish uh that uh, came to net really a pretty guy and a nice release, um, sending them back, send them back healthy. Um, this was again, one of those shots I used my iPhone with 
on a burst mode. So I probably took 60 or 80 pictures in that three or four second period um, and was able to pick and choose a few out of there to, to grab the, the best ones. And you, you occasionally get some really, really good shots. And I like this one for the sun glistening off the, the fins in the background. If you can see how shallow the water is behind uh, my net, it's just really quite shallow. This is a picture I ran into not too long ago. I found from days of old and uh, I was pulling into the Crane Prairie boat launch by the resort one morning and there's a big uh, paper plate, cougar sighting, 827 of 12. And then right below it, we've got the uh, Leanna grad gathering and they're both pointing to the same direction. So I wasn't quite sure if the cougar and the um, grad gathering were happening at the same place or what kind of cougar we're talking about or, or whatever. But I've, I've always thought this was a little comical to have this picture, uh, just a cougar sighting right there by the resort. Um, they're out there and they're some of the animals we rarely get to see, but they probably see you. And always lots of bugs. This was uh, in June this year during that damsel hatch again in real, real shallow water, uh, not too far off the cultus channel, off in the trees and in the structure. I had, I can't tell you how many dozens of damsels crawling up my anchor ropes and onto the boat and hatching out. So certainly the fall uh, introduces us to the Coconese salmon run. This was taken just a few weeks back at Cow Meadow Campground, uh, which is the upper Deschutes flowing into Crane Prairie. I'm probably less than a quarter mile above the lake here, right near the bridge uh, at Cow Meadow Campground. And this pair of kokanee was, was spawning. The little flat above the bridge was full of kokanee. And uh, you can see a few of them. Um, this is right next to the bank as they're uh, getting ready to spawn and and uh, just kind of a neat sight to see um, some of those things uh, that you get to see when you're out. It's not always about fishing. There's some some other pretty cool things that happen out at Crane, but there are always these. This is a big, big square tail. Um, again, taken in very shallow water sight casting to a fish, and that fish was probably 24 inches and uh, took a little size 20, um, that food court midge pattern I showed you earlier uh, in, in very, very shallow water. So again, sight cast to him. And my hike into Osprey Point in the middle of winter with the with the ice on the uh, on the lake. This is the time of year I'm usually at home um, tying flies, but this particular day it was really uh, just really eerie being out here because the the lake or the ice was groaning and moaning as I was casting uh, my camera up toward the uh, sisters and broken top and bachelor. Uh, really a cool sight. And a final little sunset. So any questions from you all? I had a question, which hardware do you use? What uh, depth finder do you use the Navi Navionic software on? I uh, just upgraded mine this year to uh, a Lowrance 12 inch unit. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's the Elite TI series. It's kind of their midline um, and uh, it's a really nice unit on the boat. The bigger screen is nice to be able to see a lot more detail. Often I've got depth, I've got mapping, and I've got structure showing on my screen all at one time. Um, I, can, I can cordon off my screen into different portions. And so from there, you, would, uh, you actually have to buy the Navionic software independent of your fish finder. Uh, Lawrence has um, mapping software. It does not have channels. And so, you know, it'll work up at East Lake and gives you depth and all that kind of stuff. But 
what's really the value in avionics for Crane Prairie is the channels and knowing where those are. That is worth the price of admission. Yep. Thank you. Um, Phil, I found this really useful because I really have no clue what I'm doing up at, uh, up at Crane. And so <laughs> this idea of, uh, you know, you do this in the spring and you do this in the summer and you do th this in the fall is really helpful. Thank you. Well, I learned that the hard way because I always went out and fished the channels with coronamids and boy, I did yep. great some days and lots of days I didn't do worth a darn and I never knew why until I uh, opened up my horizons and started exploring the lake a bit. Yeah, no, that was excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, Phil, Mike wants to know if there's any, uh, where, if you were to fish before the end of the season out there, like the next mm -hmm. week, what mm -hmm. would you do and where would you go first thing? Oh, great. Th great question. Um, I haven't been up there in about two and a half weeks. Um, and things have obviously changed weather-wise since then. But the Deschutes flat um, up toward the mouth in probably four to eight feet of water. I like to motor around with my uh, electric trolling motor until I start seeing fish. Uh, in the shallower water. And once I start seeing fish, I'll back off them and cast. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time fishing a spot if I'm not seeing fish in that clear water up there shallow. Um, the fish are beginning to move out of, uh, you know, the weed beds are starting to die back significantly. Um, the water has cooled down. And those fish can kind of be anywhere right now. Uh, but a couple other areas to, to look to would be in real shallow on Deschutes, um, the upper Deschutes arm. Uh, real shallow, there are some holes and channel uh, areas on upper Deschutes. I would motor around those and see if there are fish in there. If they're not, I would go and look deeper. Um, a lot of that flat in shallow is like two to five feet of water uh, is where I'm talking about. And if you're not seeing fish in there, keep moving out and get out a little bit deeper. Uh, one of the other areas that at least two and a half weeks ago when I was on crane was holding a lot of fish was in shallow at Cultus. Um, way on high at Cultus, and uh, there were lots of fish up there. That is a tough fishery. Gin clear water, cold, um, very, very selective fish. Uh, I have a lot of fun when I go up there just trying to figure it out. I don't usually catch tons of fish, but if I catch a few on dry flies, uh, it's great. And so, um, Again, I would motor around looking for fish. A lot of that just shoots, or excuse me, cultus flat in real shallow, really weeded over this late summer. And so some of the areas fish hold um, normally were not accessible to them. They stayed a little more channel oriented. Um, there's a nice little river flow coming into the lake right there. And so you're, you're actually drifting flies with the current in, in shallow like that. So this time of year, those are a couple of good options to try. If that doesn't work, um, just move and keep exploring okay. until you, okay. you find stuff. The channel edges along Quinn um, can be good uh, this time of year. Again, I would not really focus on deep, deep water. I'd focus on that probably four to 10 feet um, would be where I'd target this year. But there have been a lot of fish up in the Quinn channel as well. So Phil, it's gonna be wet and cold. I, I kind of doubt I'd, I'd be hitting more than one spot. <laughs> but, <laughs> Wimp, what, there's no what? such thing. No <laughs> such thing as bad weather, only bad gear. <laughs> So what would you suggest as fly-wise, small midge patterns? Um, 
we're moving back into Corona mid time. Yeah. Um, or we have moved into Corona mid time. Um, let's see. Uh, balanced leeches, Corona mids. I would probably start with those things. Mm -hmm. Um, small little uh olive caddis i use a little olive bird's nest i use quite a bit uh i don't know if it's as effective this time of year as it was a few weeks back so but I, definitely leeches are important all year long at crane that's probably the first fly i almost always start with mm -hmm. and uh coronamids are becoming important now too Sounds great. Thanks. And the uh, boat safety was uh, a good um, thought to put in there. Uh, I have to say that when we first started fishing out there, somebody told us that the stumps are so old that even if you hit one, it'll just break. No, I don't, it stopped our boat. <laughs> oh, yeah, it does. <laughs> You know, Maryland Forester rescued two guys a couple years ago <laughs> out in Crane that had dumped their boat oh, no. in, in 50 degree weather. Oh. And she said she, she barely got them to shore. Um, wow. So, yeah, it happens. Yeah, it's uh, it can be a dangerous lake. I, I didn't really talk about the wind coming up, but the wind can come up and howl in the afternoon and it can get fairly rough fairly quickly. I've never really seen it, you know, threatening uh, a good solid boat, but it, it can blow and get rough. And, uh, you know, for that reason, I, I made it a practice of wearing a, a life vest all the time. And I do hit stumps darn near every time out unless I'm staying in the channels. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a few areas that I like in toward, oh, the little Cultus River, little uh, Deer Creek uh, at certain times of the year, way back toward early summer or late spring. Um, you know, those are, uh, those are areas to target as well. And uh, you're, you're back in trees in there. You, you kind of motor into the middle of the trees and you find, try and find a little open spot um, where you've got a little room to play a fish if you hook something. You know, if you can find a 30 or 40 yard little pond area that doesn't have a lot of structure, um, that's a good place to, to get into back in the trees. So somebody asked if um, you ever fish the Cultus River. Um, I've walked in there a couple of times. Um, you know, the Cultus River is very, very shallow throughout its uh, course, and it doesn't have much fertility. It's so cold, and it doesn't have a lot of food in it. Um, and so... I've never really seen much in the way of fish in there at all whatsoever. Um, I know in the fall when the kokanee run, the, the eagles will get back in there and feast on the kokanee because they spawn in the Cultus River. But I've never really seen rainbow trout or uh, in any meaningful way. So not really. Um, I do fish the upper deschutes a lot and I fish it all the way down you know, cow meadow and all the way up to a uh, little, little lava. Um, and that's has crane fish uh, migrating up the uh, upper the chutes. Uh, but the cultist doesn't seem to, except for very isolated time periods. Rainbows will run up in the cultists uh, and spawn, but they probably do it before the season starts. Hey, Phil, I, uh, this is Steve. I just wanted to say uh, your lion's mane damsel has been a fantastic fly for me. I've been tying it pretty small and sparse mm -hmm. and, and it's in that cover line and um, by far the best damsel pattern I've ever used. So thanks for sharing mm. that with us. I'm glad to hear that. That is a good one. Um, the uh, In the video that I did, it kind of looks like it's a much more, uh, 
less sparse fly than it really is, but when you get it wet, it's really sparse. I tie it in olive. Are there any other colors I should try? Yes, I would try a little uh, anywhere from tan to rust. Um, had a day out on the flats between uh, the Upper Deschutes and Cultus. Um, there are some big flat, there's some big Thule islands out in that area. And uh, during the caddis hatch, they want to swim into those Thule islands and crawl out and hatch. And so, they, God, there were a scat of fish um, up and around those Thule islands. And uh, I was fishing a little rust colored, kind of a light rust colored on a hover line, unweighted, no glass bead, no nothing. And I was just inching it back, just fishing it as slow as I pop up, pro possibly could in about four to six feet of water. And uh, my boatmate was getting frustrated because I kept hooking up and he didn't, he didn't have a hover line and couldn't fish slow enough to, um, to really tempt those fish on damsels. Good tip, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other so questions? Any yeah, any last questions before we uh, finish up for the evening? No? Well, thanks, Phil. That was a great well, presentation. Thank you, guys. Hopefully you all learned some about Crane. It's, it's been a lot of long, painful lessons to uh, learn all that I've learned out there. And uh, it's kind of nice to go out with this background uh, nowadays and have a lot more consistent success than I did uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago.